In today's Coffee and Hustle, we discuss practical tips, the fears of losing clients, and the pressure to bring in continuous work. Taking those risks in the unknown is scary because you never know how things would turn out. While it might result in success, it could also fail. Joining me in today's discussion is Laura Terrell, an executive coach with over 25 years of experience as a legal and business leader. She offers an insider perspective for business, legal, and corporate professionals. Hello, and welcome to our Coffee and Hustle podcast today. And we have a great episode for you. Um, I am so excited um, to for you to meet our new guest. And we're going to talk about the how to deal with the real fear of losing clients and Every business owner, we tend to kind of go through these things, you know, the ups and downs and trials of our business. But then how do we overcome those fears? And today we're going to talk with, um, you know, our guest, which is Laura Terrell. She is a um, an exec, you know, executive coach uh, with over 25 years of experience in legal and business leader in the industry. Now, before she comes on, I, I want to talk about her experience. She has a great resume and I want to um, kind of express that in this podcast because her knowledge is going to be really good for you to listen in today and tune in to some of the tips that she's going to share with you on your business. So prior to coaching, um, she was a special assistant to the president of the White House, a senior level uh, appointee of the U.S. Department of Justice, and a partner in uh, two, uh, not just one, but two global law firms. And um, Laura has some great experience. Welcome to our podcast today. I really appreciate you being on. Thanks, Carla. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So this was our second time we've tried to get together. Our first time was a trial and error because we had some weather problems. But Laura, thank you for sticking in and wanting to come back on our podcast and do this recording with us today because I thought this was a really good topic, especially today in the economics of the ups and downs and things that we're seeing on you know, in the media right now, we're seeing people losing their jobs. Um, we're also seeing people job hop- hopping from job to job. Um, can you kind of give us some insight on what you do with businesses that are in the market right now? So I am an executive coach, as as you kindly introduced me. I have uh, a long career working as a lawyer, but also as a business advisor with many individuals, companies, helping them not only navigate the legal problems that they have, but also working through some of the very real business challenges. And often the business challenges um, intersect with some of the legal challenges. And I also work a lot with people that are building their businesses, whether that's as lawyers or as professionals in real estate, consulting, accounting, uh, lobbying, public relations. I work with people that want to grow their business and sometimes are just starting to grow it or sometimes really aren't sure how to take it forward. But also, as you point out, Carla, in this economy, a lot of people that are starting to worry what happens to my business when clients start asking for discounts or thinking about looking elsewhere or just I start worrying about where my pipeline is for my business going forward. You know, um, I don't know if you've ever saw it, but there's some reels on Instagram that go around where people take things and they throw them in a box and go, this is, you know, what the client expects, but yet they want to, what is it, the champagne taste on a beer budget kind of aspect. And um, businesses these days are, we're all looking for ways to save money and things like that. But there's our, there's places we should not, you know, shortcome our business What are some of those things that you would tell clients like, all right, how do you get your foot in the door or how do you build that business from scratch? How do you, what kind of advice do you give them? I suggest to my clients that they try to look creatively at what they can do, particularly on pricing. And this is something that I learned as a lawyer. There are multiple ways to price. People think of lawyers as having the dreaded billable hour where you get billed always by the hour. But I also encourage my legal clients to think about alternative fee arrangements. Are there success fees that you can put in place if you do well on a particular matter? Are there discounts that you can offer that that success fee could compensate for? Are there ways you could offer a flat rate to be able to do work? And I think the same applies in business. Sometimes you need to think creatively about what services you're offering. And a client, as you say, may be telling you, 
I want a whole box of things. I want A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, but they're only really willing to pay for A through C. And so you have to walk them through, this is what I can do for that amount. Or what I'd recommend is maybe we do A and B, but F instead, because that's a more urgent need for you. Try to think creatively and really listen to your client about what they're asking for and what they need and what you can provide for them within the budget they're looking for. Yeah, because I think that in some ways or another, not every client should be a client for us, right? And I think it's just always, sometimes it's like, is it worth um, going that extra mile? Sometimes it is, if you can if you can look at that, maybe you have to take a, a kind of a, uh, kind of like a cut in your budget to get the business in that you're looking for, um, sometimes those are worth the challenges that you may take on, right? So I think that when I started my business, sometimes um, I look back and go, you know, I did lose um, money in the beginning, right? I I lost money, um, you know, in certain, in certain projects just because I was, you know, I knew that sooner or later it was worth the challenge to bring them on and add more things. Do you give people that guidance as long as they know that they can forecast it? I suggest to clients that they be thoughtful about what it is that they're looking for. For example, as you say, if they're starting out or maybe if they're switching their focus, maybe they used to work with uh, companies in the marketing industry, but they're really looking to switch over to companies in the healthcare industry, maybe to provide them with accounting services or, or some other services, if you're looking to get into a new sector, you're probably going to have to either discount or give some work that might be at a rate that's different from what you'd ultimately aspire to. You might also have to give what, you know, all of us refer to as a freebie. You might want yeah. to say, you know, I'll give you three free hours of work or I'll do a consultation or I'll yeah. do a mock-up of what I think this might look like for you. And then if you want to go forward with it, this would be my rate to complete it. So I think you have to be willing to put yourself out there. I think that's a great way of looking at it. But I also think, as you say, you have to be realistic. Now, if you're five years into that segment of the business, you may no longer be willing to provide as many freebies just based upon the bandwidth that you have as a business, the time you have available, where you want to spend your time. And you may also be less willing to give established clients those freebies because they have a history of working with you and you should be able to come to an accommodation on payments with them. You know, sometimes um, when you look back at your business, do you do you see things that you could have changed, or do you feel like there's things that you did that you you could have said I could have made a better decision? Do you do that kind of reflection in your own business when you do that? Sure, I think I think most business owners do. When I was an attorney in a large law firm, there were times I turned down work or I turned down the opportunity to pitch for work because I knew. The clients were not going to pay enough for it to cover my expenses, cover those of my team. And I don't have a lot of regrets about something like that. But sometimes you think, eh, had I done, you know, one more outreach or had I put myself out there a little bit more or even just touched base with my clients more frequently to make sure that they were staying with me and that I really understood what they were on top of. I would say a lot more of my regrets have to do with what could I have done more to keep clients that I wanted not yeah. the clients that I let go because I knew they were not the right fit for me. Did you, have you ever done that where you've gone in and said, you know what, this is not worth my, this is not my client. And at the beginning you took the client in and you're like, oh, okay, let me see if I can actually work with them. But have you ever done that where, you know what, I think this is the best for decision is to let you go. How do you do that? Well, I've had an experience similar to that where I was working for a client that I was working in one segment of their business, and that was a really good fit. It was a good fit for me and my team, but they offered me the opportunity to work in a different segment, and I just decided to be candid up front and say, you know, this isn't really a good fit for what we do. I don't think we can meet the price point you're looking at. I'm happy to keep working with you in this other sector but I don't think this is really the right fit. And I was yeah. a little bit worried that, that would mean additional opportunities wouldn't come my way in the segment that was a great fit. But instead, the client really appreciated the honesty, I think, yeah. about being clear about what we were able to do and what we thought we were best suited for. That's one piece of advice I would give people is you should certainly stretch yourself to try to work in areas that 
think I'd really like to do that. And I think we're qualified or I think we could get there. Yeah. But if you have something that somebody comes to you for that's not a great fit, you need to be honest and upfront. People appreciate that. Do you feel like that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I've always been that I kind of interviewed the client more than they do me, you know, in some ways or another when we're actually doing a consultation meeting because I have certain things that I'm looking for, certain words that I'm looking for for that particular client to say yes or no to them. And um, I think I've fired maybe one client and I have so told no to certain clients and said, no, this is not a good fit for me, but I do know someone that it might be a better fit for you to, you know, kind of like that matchmaking type situ scenario. And um, I've been in that situation before. And so at first you, you hesitate because you're, like you said earlier, it could be that fear of like, if I make this decision, is it going to backfire on me? Um, is it going to be one of those situations where I'm going to regret? And there's been times where I've held on to certain clients that I thought I should have let them go a long time ago because it just didn't, our, our personalities didn't match, you know, even though I was able to accomplish the task, but it was like, it was harder to, relationship wise, it was harder to relate to that client sometimes, or, you know, they was a lot more demand than, you know, um, than expected. So uh, sometimes you have to sit down and reevaluate that. Do you sit down and look at your clients once a year and say, you know what, this is a great client. I want to expand on this. Um, do I want to let this client go? Do you do that kind of an evaluation on your business that way? Sure. I look at clients that I think uh, probably have not been a great fit, and I try to work with them to complete the project that we're doing. I try to work with them to get to where they need to go. But at a certain point, I also am realistic that it just may not be the best suited relationship, and it's it's important to be upfront about that. I will say that doesn't happen very often to me as a coach because coaching is so personal. And like you, Carla, I interview my potential clients. They interview me. We really try to find the right match, but sometimes life intervenes. You know, somebody loses focus or they have a family member that gets sick and they're not able to move forward. I'm, I'm sure you also need contributions and feedback and input from your clients. And sometimes yes. life gets in the way for those clients and they can't do that. And, and then I try to do a correction and say, you know, I feel like we're not getting each other what we need right now. Should we pause on this and come back? I have clients that also say to me, I need to take a pause or I need to take a few months to ruminate on this and see what direction I want to go in next. But I'd like to come back to you then and see how we move forward. So I've been open to doing that when the timing's just not right and something's come up in the relationship that might be able to be remediated down the road. You know, when I was, um, I think that for years, I kind of always thought that I had to do everything by myself. And I thought my thoughts had to be my own and I didn't know how to share them. And so um, I fought the idea of having a business coach. And when I when I actually did it the first time, um, the timing was off for me. You know, I mean, I wasn't perfectly ready for it. I wasn't I think I was sensory overloaded. I think sometimes I, you know, I wasn't accept. I didn't want to accept the things that I was doing in my business was wrong. Right. Because I always thought every decision I made was perfect, right? Because, you know, I'm perfect. But, I mean, I know we're not, right? But I think there's certain points in our times where we go, okay, let me give this a second chance. And so when you're able to open yourselves up as a business owner, because, listen, let's be honest. I mean, owning a business is very difficult, you know. Um, we have to balance a lot. Um, the, the different personalities on our teams, um, being a balance of being a mom or a father, or whatever we are, business owners, we have that balance of always thinking about our business, but yet we're all, we have to be in tune to what's going on around us all the time. So when we look at those things in businesses, because you went from corporate America to now doing this, was there a big change or how did you get from going as this exclusive corporate industry to now being this your business coach now how did you get into this transition you know it's interesting you ask me that because I felt like it was in some ways an easier transition for me because being in 
the corporate world as a lawyer in a private law firm, I was responsible for my own P&L. I might have been one of several hundred lawyers in a very large firm that had such responsibilities, but I had to deliver at the end of the day. I had to point to my revenues. I had to point to my expenses. I had to point to my realization, how aging my receivables were and what my intentions were for collecting on them. I apply those same principles in my own business. I'm probably just more used to being accountable for myself. But when I talk with business owners, those are some of the things I try to draw out in them. I've had business owners that have said to me, you know, I was just never really good at math or finances, and I really feel like I'm struggling here. Sometimes when we start to draw out what you learned in a corporate environment, there are lessons there for how you can help yourself as a small business owner. For example, I had a client that was lamenting, again, their math skills, their financial capability. It turned out this person, however, had been really good in their corporate life at preparing budgets and keeping to budget. And I said, do you know how many people would be really envious of that skill? Yes. If you can do that as a small business owner, you've already put yourself a lot of the way there. You might still need an accountant. You might still yeah. need a tax advisor. Yeah. You might still need somebody to document and log in your expenses, but you've gotten really good at this budget thing. Don't, don't say that you can't manage that side of your business yeah. because you already have. You've just done it in a different context. You know, there's, you know, when you're running a business, I mean, let's be honest, I mean, we have to bring in new clients, we have to keep our existing clients happy, we have to, you know, there's this, these layers, right? And of course, we think about the financial aspect, um, you know, and then also the accounting department, you know, that all of those things, I don't, I don't really necessarily prepares us for that side of the business, like, we we know that we could do this, right? We know that what we do or the service we provide are good at. But then all of those those other layers of things that are that that run behind us that makes us succeed, right? We don't necessarily like them, right? I mean, just like you said, this person not really good in math, not very good in the financial aspect. Because I think about a lot of stuff thinking wow, if I would have known what I know now financially or how to invest back into my business or how, you know what I mean? What I can only imagine where I would be right now, right? So those are those steps, things that, that one really teaches you. You can go to college, you can get a degree in it, but we're not ready for all that. And how do you prepare a business? Because, you know, like being a coach, right? You have to uh, get them to understand every part of the business, not just, you know, going out to sell their product or services like we normally do. But how do you get them to understand there's other sides of the business that they've got to manage? I think one thing to contemplate is what are the elements of your business that are, you're going to need to operate? You might say, well, I'm in the services Area. I don't really need a lot of goods. I don't need a lot of infrastructure. I don't need a lot of back office to, to be able to operate in a services industry. But you might need marketing and, and business development and branding. In my case, I outsource a lot of that work because that is not my core strength. I work with people that are very skilled in that area. But I also recognized that up front when I started my business that I needed to build that in. I think when you recognize what are the key things you need to have? Accounting, tax services, branding, marketing. Maybe you need an, an AA. Maybe you need somebody that is also going to prep a lot of your materials for presentations, pitches, other documentation that you need. When you outline what you need, and then you really are realistic about what am I going to have to hire somebody for, that helps you be realistic about the number of clients you need, what you need to charge, you need to juxtapose against that. One of the things I think that's tough for a lot of small business owners is the reality that it takes time to scale your business. And in your first year, maybe your first couple of years, you're just not going to have huge revenues that vastly exceed your expenses. Most small businesses have a huge amount of startup expense, whether that's creating a website or getting business cards or ensuring that you have a functioning computer that can actually do the work that you need to do. And there's an investment up front, and how much you're committed to doing that is important. 
I think it's also realistic to recognize that you're not going to hit the ground running, even if you're the greatest salesperson, you're really good at certain things. Real estate is a good example. If you set out to be a residential real estate agent, there's a lot of competition in that field. You may have some great contacts, but it's going to take you a while to build through getting that first listing and then the turnaround on that first listing. And you want to be realistic about how much money you're going to need to put up front in the business before you ever bring in the first dollar. You know, what's uh, interesting is we don't sit down and really think about all those things when we first start our business at all. I mean, I think, you know, when I first started my business, I wanted to manage to be at home with my children, right? I had two babies. I had a, you know, my daughter was not even in kindergarten at the time. And I took a chance because I didn't want to work a 40 hour a week job, turn around and pay for daycare. And I was already side hustling. I was already doing websites designs at the war, you know, at that time. And, you know, back then it was like, you know, three to five pages was extreme, right? Because you're like, if you can get them to at least three to five page website, you're doing, you were making good money at the time. But one of the things that really is interesting is that you can start a business with an idea. An idea is really good, but then you got to understand the functionality of it too. But then I think you're right about the fact that when we're trying to scale our business, we have to be realistic on what we're good at, like what we're not good at. And one of the things is, is understanding that maybe you do need to outsource your financials, whether it's finding someone that can do bookkeeping or just somebody can answer a phone call for you when you get phone calls in. So those little things that, that you, that takes up so much of your time. I have a, a client that and I used she usually just calls me for consultation work just marketing consultation and that's it and I give her advice but she wants to handle everything she wants to handle her own social media she handles her own production she handles her own promos everything but then in some in the same breath when she does it she's like Carl this is overwhelming I'm frustrated I'm over I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing but I'm and in some ways I'm trying to tell her you need to hire somebody you need help because you can't manage to do it all in your business. And that is one of the things that you, because you, you can't do it all and still keep clients on the side. You can't keep your clients happy if you're over here trying to handle all of these other extra things. So you have to really look at your business in some ways or another and reevaluate. And it's, it's if people like you that say this, you know, being that you're a business consultant really has to push that. Do you have to push people in that direction sometimes? Is it hard for you to get those points across or do they accept what you have to say in some ways or another? Or does it take time for them to really, the light bulb comes on and go, wow, I should have done this a long time ago. I think sometimes people are just overwhelmed with the number of things they have on their plate. And often they feel, I should be doing this or I don't have time to outsource this or Someone told me that this is really important for my business right now. I was talking with someone uh, yesterday who was sharing that they had gotten a lot of feedback out of a couple of their mentors and sponsors. And that was something we'd talked about and I'd really encouraged. But one of the things that this client heard was you need to be out there networking, networking, networking. You need to be networking where you've got to network this month. You've got to do it right now. And I think one of the things I try to do with clients is work through with them. How much of that is a priority for you? How much does it benefit your business or where you are right now? And as we talked through this, the client said, I just don't really know how much I can network with people. There are basically a few weeks left until the holidays, and then people are going to be gone at the end of the year. What I really need to be doing is chasing collections right now. I really need to be getting money in the door because that's how my business is going to be able to deliver at the end of the year. I need to meet certain expenses. And so we talked about just jotting down a list of the things you need to do and highlighting the ones that are mission critical and thinking about where you move the others. I loved what you said, Carla, about um, being in touch with your clients and doing business development. One of the ways I think you get past the fear of losing your clients is being in touch with them. The easiest way to lose someone is for them not to feel appreciated or feel that you put them in line behind other things. And for most business owners, 
the number one thing we do is connect with our clients and yeah. reach out to new potential clients. The other things we may need to pay somebody else to do because that is probably our highest and best use is being the face of our business and ensuring that people still see us as valuable and that they're willing to purchase what we want to sell them. Well, you know, I mean, I think that's a very interesting aspect about our business that sometimes we tend to not do is we tend to always wanting to sell sell our services, sell our promos, sell whatever, just to get that contract signed or whatever. But I think it's so important is to understand and relate to the clients that you do have, that retention and relationship that you're trying to build with those current clients that you have because that relationship that you're trying to build with them and nurture that is so important because those are your biggest fans. Because when you do that, the secret sauce to businesses, to me, is that when you nurture that, even if it's just a quick phone call, sometimes I'll do a phone call once a week to one of my random clients that I have not heard from in a couple of weeks. All right, I'll make a phone call to them. And if they don't have time to answer the phone, I'm just saying, hey, I'm here. Just want to know that I was checking in with you. And you know what? Most of the time when they call me back, they're like, oh, my gosh. I just was thinking about you. I was just talking about you because that word of mouth marketing that I've always been a big fan of really comes back tenfold. And so when you put that client first in relationship, right, it also becomes something so much bigger because it is up to you as a business owner to always stay in touch with your clients. And I know it's hard, you know, as your client base gets bigger you know, and that's where you trust your team to start creating that relationship and you teach them how to do things. But yes, do we fear waking up every day and losing a client? Absolutely, right? Because that is the the chances that we take in business. What we have to do is make sure that we've checked everything off to make sure that that client is okay. In that getting that honest feedback, you know, Every time I talk to a client, I'm always asking for feedback because it's important to know where I stand in their business. Did I give them enough, you know, to me to do that? I love two and, things you just said there, Carla. First, about touching base with your clients. I, I think that's so important. I've urged many of my clients to really think about that. And some of them have said, well, I don't have anything to say to them. I don't have any. I know they're looking out for work for me. I know they might come back and hire me, but. What do I say to them? I said, what do, you, what do you talk about with them besides work? Well, we both really like tennis. Send them a cool article you saw about Serena Williams in her final appearance at the U.S. Open. Or yes. see if um, they're following the latest news on whoever the superstar is in the rising tennis world right now. Yeah. The other thing I love that you, you, you said was um, in terms of making sure that um, you are getting feedback from your clients. I have a number of people that I work with who are really afraid, I think, in some respects to go and ask for feedback from their clients. But if you don't ask, yeah, you'll never really learn what you're doing well or what you're not doing well, even on a great project. Yeah. I think it's wonderful to go to a client and say, I'm really glad that you were pleased with the result of that. But I also really would welcome from you, are there things that we could have done differently? Or are there things that you think would be even more value add if we were to work together again? It's how you learn and it's how you grow. It's also how you get ideas for how you could pitch to other clients. Yeah. Do you ever feel like, I think it's sometimes when you're talking to somebody, and I know, listen, not everybody should own a business, right? Because, listen, if you, and I've heard people go, I, I'm going to come out of college and I'm going to own my own business. I don't think they're ready. And I mean, I'm not trying to say that in a bad way. Sometimes it's good to go get corporate experience and find out exactly what it is that you like and what you don't like about it before you start opening your own business because we all have an idea of how we should run a business like when you work in a corporate industry you're like these are things that I would not do was there some things in your corporate industry that you go you know what this is not me and this is not what I would do I think in my experience, there were things that I learned that were incredibly valuable 
uh, the importance of the nuances of the financial picture. Again, not just what revenue you bring in, but what expenses do you have? Yeah. And, you know, it may sound great to go out to take clients out to dinner every night, but that's a lot easier when you're working on a corporate dime than you're working on yours. And sometimes I would pay attention and I would try to see, was that really making a difference with my clients? Was that something they wanted? Or did they appreciate a lot more? I really worked with them to try to get to the right financial arrangement on the services we were doing for them. So there were some things that just felt very personal to me that I learned that were just not necessarily things that worked for me in my own business, but that they did work in the corporate environment. Yeah. And I think that people also really need to think about before they start a business, what does it cost to start a business? Yeah. If you're going to rent office space, what does that overhead look like? And how many months in advance do you have to pay? If you've worked in a corporation or another organization and you've learned that you have to pay three months in advance on your rent or that you have to put down a security deposit or that you need to be able to have a certain threshold to be able to even qualify for those things, that's good learning yeah. for when you start your own business. It may tell you right now, rather than renting office space, you may want to see if you can do this out of your home, your garage, some spare space, somebody that you know can lend you for free for a while. You know, um, when you start thinking about the fears of your business, like the fears of losing clients, right? Some of us fear that we won't get clients. You know, um, I can remember back in the day when, you know, networking was just not a big thing. You went through the Chamber of Commerce, right? And you met people through certain things, right? But when you were a stay-at-home mom and you had children, um, you were just fortunate enough to know that you had just enough clients to pay your bills, you know, to move you along. But I do remember that time where I was the fear of like, okay, I don't know. Do you remember that? Like you had to make your, to make a business successful, you had to get to that seven year. You know, I don't know if you remember that rule, you know, how many years, you, you know, can mean that you could be successful. And there was always that year. I would always count it every year. I'd be like, okay, my first year, I made it. My fifth year, I made it. My seventh year, okay, this is something. This must be something because I'm now I'm seven years in and I'm like, I finally made it. So I think there's always some sort of fear. Do you always, do you have fear at all in your business at all? I think you're always worried about, am I going to get the right next client? Um, am I going to get that client that I really pitched and I really wanted? Or I really love that client and that client left. Does that mean that I'm not doing something right or something that, didn't work for them. I had yeah. a wonderful client that I really enjoyed working with. And I was really disappointed at one point because I thought we were making great progress. The client said, you know, I just, I need to kind of take a break. And then I didn't hear back from them. A client actually ended up referring me to several other clients who engaged me. And okay. I thought, you know, this wasn't the 5X project that I thought it would be. It wasn't the 5X client. Um, but it was a client that was profitable for me and helped sow seeds. I've had a lot of people that have done that. One of the things I firmly believe about business development is you always have to be looking for clients. You always have to be nurturing clients and you never know where they're going to come from. I've heard so many people say in corporate life and in law firm life, I was so certain I was going to get this friend of mine or this partner I used to work with. They were going to send me big business and they didn't. And I was so disappointed. But there are other people that may send you business and that you want to network with and you want yeah. to connect with um, because you can't count on certainties from the ones that you think. You need to be prospecting for ones that might be possibilities. So I think it is a very real fear to worry about where your business is coming from. But it also, I think, should make you hungry to go out and to keep looking for that next client and to be thinking about where your pipeline is. And if you're feeling you're not getting the right clients, what are you doing that you might want to do differently yeah. to do client development? You know, I think there's a point in time in our business that we have to look at when we have to reevaluate our business. And I take time throughout the year. There's a couple of times where I do production time where I reevaluate it, but at, toward the end of the year, I basically look at my business as, as a summary 
and I take all my clients, I'm gonna give y'all some secrets. I take my clients and I break them all apart and I summarize them on what was successful for them, was it wasn't successful, you know, what do I need to forecast for them so that I can turn around and do that. And then I have them fill out a form. It's a goal form. It's an online form. So um, I used to make a paper copy back in the day because we didn't have all these nice, beautiful online forms. But I have an online form now. And they have, they have to fill it out. I give them a certain time. And they fill this out. And it kind of gives me an idea of where they're at in their head. Because, you know, we're, we're mind readers, right? In our, in our business, we're mind readers. And so I got to get them to where they'll, you know, not that they have to write it out now, but at least fill it out. Do you reevaluate your business? Do you kind of go, you know what, there's times and places in my business that I need to pivot or not that we want to reuse that word over because I, I think it's overused, it's the word pivot. But do you ever look at your business and go, maybe I need to go in a different direction or there's parts of the business that I'm more available for, you know, there might be success in these other parts of my business. Do you look at that at all? Oh, gosh, yes. Um, I do different types of coaching than I thought I would do when I first started out as a coach. There oh, yeah. are people I work with that I didn't know if I would necessarily be comfortable, felt that I was skilled enough to be able to work in that area. But people came to me and I asked for some grace from them. I gave them a discount to start doing that work and I felt more comfortable with it over time. The other thing is I set kind of a quarterly look back um, so not just at the end of the year, but every quarter I look at what are some milestones that I hit? What are some accomplishments that I found? Yeah. And where do I think I could do differently? I also have revenue goals. I have um, monitoring on my expenditures that I look at monthly. Yeah. So that's probably a little bit more uh, than some people do in a small business to to constantly. But for me, it's a looking at that pattern. I'm also trying to see where things are happening at different times in the year. When am I having clients that come to me? What do I need to do? I mean, look, right now I'm really focused on how I want to launch 2023. I'm sure you are too. Oh yeah. What are your goals That's, and where yeah. do you want to start and where do you want to kick off? But if you're not yeah. doing that now, yeah, you're behind when you get to the first of the year. Actually, um, I um, so one of my goals this year is reorganizing. And I know that sounds like so simple, right? But I'm a hoarder when it comes to certain things I've kept over the years. I mean, you got to think I've been doing this for over 20 something years, right? And I've hoarded like PDFs and how to's and, you know, documents and things that I've kept for years thinking I need it. I got to have it. And then my Google doc, my Google folders are filled with info, right? Because I'm always looking for stuff. I'm always reading things. And so my team said, Carla, you need to clean up your files. And so this year was all about organization um, and simplifying the technique of what we're trying to do for our clients. Um, because if it's overcomplicated and I try to explain to my clients, they don't necessarily understand every little data analytical you know aspects of their business because if i did it they would be very overwhelmed um but it's my job to be able to simplify that so we are talking about this year simplifying um you know the next year uh, i had thought about what my word would be for next year i don't know if you do that or not but i also look at what is my word of the year and that's my word that i focus on all year round and so I did choose a word this year. I've already made it for 2023, and that's the word forward. I don't want to look back and go, okay, what did I do that was wrong? Or what was my mistakes or anything like that? I want to take my business forward, and I'm trying to figure out what that looks like, right? I already have a vision of what it is, and I'm already manifesting what that looks like. And businesses that, if you're in business, no matter what, you have to take time and pause in your business. You have to. It's great that you're you're out networking, you're great handshakes, throwing out those business cards, but you have to sit down and reflect on what's working and what's not working in your business. And I think that's important. Would you do you give advice like that or not? 
Well, I think what you just outlined is so important. You say reorganization doesn't sound like something that is maybe something everyone can relate to, but what you're describing is putting your business and putting your control of your business in a better place. One of the things I, I loved that a colleague of mine once said to me, a woman who was an attorney in the practice group where I worked many years ago, she said, I've decided next year is the year of saying no. I'm going to say no to things because she was hotly in demand. She was really terrific as an attorney and she was asked to do many things, but she was getting stretched too thin. I was thinking of her recently because one of the things I need to do in the next year is I need to say no to some of the travel that comes my way, some of the opportunities that require me to travel. And I'm talking about getting on planes and things like that. And I find for the business that I have, I need more time at my desk. I need more time connecting with clients I have. I can't be on a plane every two weeks. There was something in a prior life where I did that much more professionally. But so I, I love that that line, the art of saying no. Um, I've talked to clients about that and clients respond also to that. Sometimes our goals are not what we have to do. It's what we need not to do. But it isn't amazing that you get into the business and you have the, the, I think the word fear, right, can hold us back. But I think also it's a, a fear of like taking it and doing something with it. Because sometimes like when we start our business, we are going in one direction. And then all of a sudden we may be looking at a different direction. We have to recognize that and accept that maybe what we thought initially, what we wanted to do with our business was what we wanted. But actually there might be some other avenues that we've not thought about actually turn out to be better things for our business. And sometimes it's up to you as a coach, right, that you get them to recognize those avenues, right? Is that what you do for them? I think I hear avenues that they outline, and I like to highlight those back to my clients. My clients really provide the information. When somebody says to me, this is the year of saying no, I say, great, that's a wonderful concept. What are you saying no to? Yeah. And what that you can no to? a whole different segment of the conversation. Yeah, that a whole that can change a lot of things when you start saying no. Well, there's an know. emotion behind it. And the emotion is, I feel overwhelmed or I feel overworked or I feel like I have too much or I don't feel like I have enough time for the things I need. So it's important to break that down. What does that mean when somebody says, I want to say no? Is it a specific type of work? Is it working with people that maybe are toxic in their workplace? Is it perhaps changing a client that's been a real sore point and has been difficult? I think that can mean different things to different people. So what I try to do with my clients is when I hear them expressing a fear, an emotion, a concern, let's break that down. What does that look like? And what are the specifics of how you want to respond to that? You know, when we look at the word, like I said earlier, with fear, sometimes we, it's not necessarily losing certain clients is not exactly bad, right? Because there's certain things like you just said earlier, there was a client that you really liked and you really wanted to keep them on, but yet they gave you referrals. So sometimes those losing those clients, you know, it's, a, do we feel guilty? Maybe we didn't do something um, that we could have done better. Um, and I think when we get that feedback right from that client going okay all right i know we're no longer working together what could i've done better and what 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 are some of those questions or what would you give advice for those your clients that lose a client what do you how how do you help them through that process some of the questions i would urge them to ask are what didn't work here what could i have done differently also what could the client have done differently I had a client that I lost once that I was really, really disappointed in. It was a very abrupt parting. And looking back, and it takes a while sometimes to look back. Yeah. But looking is. back a few months later, I realized it had never really been a great relationship with the client. The client had not wanted to put in the time or the investment that was necessary. So it was more of your investment, right? For the engagement. And the client also 
I was in a legal advisory capacity then, was just very difficult about the legal advice that was being given, questioning whether we were interpreting the law a certain way, whether we were doing it accurately. And I don't mind being challenged, but this was an instance where the client was just spinning wheels, I think, constantly challenging yeah. rather than saying, okay, what does this mean for us? Or telling me, I don't like this advice, but that's because it's difficult for my business. How can we mitigate the impact on the business? So it wasn't a good fit. So I, I think it's always important to ask, what could I do differently? What could the client have done differently? Or what did I need from the client that I didn't get? That's also another great way to set expectations up front. You know, with um, I think that we're so now watching the TV and watching the, the news that's, you know, coming across that, that you know, we're, we see inflation happening more and more. Um, there's a possibility of the job losses coming. Um, what do you, how do you get people that own a business? How do you stabilize them to go, you know, what, just keep moving forward? Do you keep, you know, what, how, what advice are you giving to them with the things that are happening right now? Well, some of it is the same advice you'd give to somebody on their personal finances. If you're feeling stretched financially, are there expenses you can cut or are there expenses you can reduce? Let's say you're getting ready to do a major software upgrade in your business. Can you delay that by a quarter? Or is it something that you can get a payment plan on so that you can pay it over time rather than all up front? Um, if you're looking to do a website upgrade, and I know I'm speaking to your line of business, Carla, maybe there are people that really would like to transform their whole website or build a new one, but they don't have the capacity for it right now. Can you offer them a couple of hours of time or a mini session or a mini website refresh or maybe just a certain segment of their website rather than the whole thing? I think you're trying to find ways to get revenue when people are saying, I can't afford to meet you at 5X, but I could do 2X with you. And I think cutting those expenses is, is relevant too if you have um, travel that's on the horizon that's costly. If you have office space that's costly, if you are um, encountering other expenses that you might be able to reduce, it's no different than looking at what your budget is for your groceries, your rent, and your utilities every month personally. You've got to start looking for some ways to cut those as well. You know, we all um, use, you know, when we're in business as long as we are, right, and, and you learn from the failures and, you know, the ups and downs, um, I think that one of the things is that we're always afraid of change, right? And so I did, I was watching this guy on uh, some Instagram uh, post um, a couple months ago, and he was super excited. He came on and he says, I'm super excited to get this great and wonderful client. And they had a great relationship. And he said, I would never lose this client. Within, I think it was like six months later, he lost the client. And he said, never, never uh, underestimate the fact that you may wake up one day and not have business. But I think at some point in time, when you know, I look at my business sometimes and I don't know, you know, I could have just closed the doors. Um, I could have walked away from it and started something completely different. But I think there's sometimes you have to really believe in your business and believe in what you do, and, and it'll come back. And I think that's a one of those big strategies that I've worked on over the years. But how do you tell, you know, people not to be afraid of their business? Or I think it's how do you handle those encouraging words to give them? What do you tell them? We all have ups and downs in our business lives, just as we do in our personal lives. There are very few people who have not experienced significant setbacks at one point or another. And you are going to experience a setbacks. You are going yes. to lose a client. You are going to have days when your revenues are not what they should be. How you prepare for that is more important, both your mindset and the practical steps you take. And I think the mindset is in part recognizing that if you have a plan for how to bring your business back, if you have a plan for how you're gonna go after that pipeline. You lose that client, but you've got three more that you're chasing. You have a plan for how to recover from that. I think that's a good mindset. I think the practical steps you take are also to realize that 
you may not have the same cash flow all year long, or you may not have the same cash flow every year. How do you prepare for that as a business? If your business is generating a significant amount of income for you and your family, how can you get in front of that by maybe reevaluating what income you expect on a quarterly basis from your business and whether that's realistic in terms of the ups and downs that you encounter? There are businesses that really get a huge amount of cash flow and demand, for example, at the holidays, toys for children, toy companies, greeting card companies, um, specialty things like gift boxes and gift hampers and things like that, that people are often giving towards the December end of year timeframe. Those companies don't have a lot of runway during the beginning of the year, so they have to prepare for that and they can't spend all that money they bring in. So I think having some practical realities about the ups and downs of your business is important and putting some money away for rainy days, if you can. It takes a lot of work to be able to get to that point. But if you have an emergency, you have an unexpected expense in your business, having something built in to try to address that is enormously comforting, and I think enormously reassuring. Well, you know, um, speaking on that, because I did actually write that down, steps to help you to bounce back when you're losing a client. And I think that's so important to understand is that you're, it's, if you really truly believe in your business, it's okay. You will bounce back, but you will lose a client. You will not every day is going to be sunshines and rainbows, right? And some days it's going to be harder to get people to understand, you know, why. But one of the things that I did that changed my business, and I'll share with you, is that I read a book called Profit First, and it reorganizes my finances, like you said. I think it's really important to make sure that we have the backup of our income coming in. And so I I have different accounts set up for different things. So as my income comes in, my recurring account, I have percentages set up to to recover. So I have certain amounts that cover my expenses. I have a certain amount set up to my any of my recurring software. So one of the things that I've done is that I have a spreadsheet that has a list of all of my expenses, including all the softwares, all of my subscriptions and things that we use, you know. And then I go back every year and go, did I, do I need this? Do I need to pay this bill again? And, and but I also go out and look at things that I can pay for the full year. Instead of like paying month to month, Sometimes you look for those opportunities, you know, for like, you know, sales during this time of the year is when you look for things going, actually, I, you know, can I get a discount on this software and get it for a better price and get a full, you know, and then I'll pay for a whole year on it instead of the month to month. So when you look at your business, you know, listen, and it's not like I did this over, you know, years. This was like things that I've learned over the years. I wish somebody had these books set up for me. So when I started my business, I already had this going out the door. I could have had a lot more money in my bank account if I was a little bit smarter on budgeting my own business because we all make mistakes. And you know what I mean? Or you're like, hey, I got this paycheck and I'm just going to blow it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you're like, oh my gosh, I just regret that. Um, you know, because you're expecting another paycheck to come in to recover you. And all of a sudden, you you know, th that client calls and cancels on you at the last minute. I've had those before. So when you, how do you tell someone to, what are the biggest things that you can do to say to, to your potential clients or your clients, how to avoid on losing a client? What are those things that you could tell them to do? I tell them first to nurture your clients. And to stay connected, just as you were outlining, Carla, ask for feedback, stay in touch with them. Don't take your clients for granted. Yeah. But also recognize that when you lose a client, it's an opportunity to ask, what could I have done differently? What could the client have done differently? Ask for a postmortem. Is there something that would change this? What would you recommend to me as you know, someone providing this service? that I could do differently or that you think would be beneficial for other clients. Even when you have a bad experience, such as letting go, being let go by a client, I think getting that feedback is critical. 
The other thing I would say is recognize that you always need to have a pipeline, just like the example that you outlined, the person who said, oh, I'm going to have that client forever. Almost nothing is forever. You have to be constantly working in that pipeline and thinking, boy, I've got a great long-term 18-month engagement for a client that's paying me $20,000 a month. Well, that's great, but you know that company could go bankrupt. They could decide to change their mind, or you could decide this is really not the right arrangement for you. What are you doing to prospect for additional clients and look for other opportunities? You know, I mean... Think about what's important in your business. Um, one of the things you touched on earlier was the networking part, you know, going out and networking with a lot of people. And I see a lot of people networking, but I've cut back on my networking this year. Um, and I made a decision on, you know, why I wanted to do it. It was, on, it was something I wanted to do internally for my business. And because I wanted to restructure and reorganize my business and figure out what was important. So networking wasn't as top priority for me as, as much as, as anything. Now, do I miss that, you know, day-to-day -day kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's times where, you know, um, I see things and going, gosh, I wish I was there. But my business production was much more important, you know, so you have to pick and choose. Um. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, I know these are kind of off the cuff, but I want to ask you something. How do you how do you describe business success? How do you describe that to someone? I think that's different for every person. I think that's, again, a goal you need to define for yourself. You might be a business owner that says, I consider business success if I'm profitable and I have profit of $50,000 my first year or Someone else might say, I would consider business success if I drive this business forward and I'm able to have it go public or get picked up by another company and it gets bought at a 8x ratio or whatever the goal is. Or I would consider this a, success, a successful business if, to one of the things that you said, Carla, if I'm able to do this as a parent and I'm able to be present for my family and I'm able to do this in a flexible way so that I'm able to meet both personal needs and business needs. So I think it's going to vary for everyone. You know, you said earlier you were from um, Birmingham, right? So we're both very Southern girls. Um, I was um, I raised uh, mostly in the lower, we call it L.A., Alabama, by the way, L.A., lower Alabama. But both of us are both um, Southern girls, right? So, you know, growing up, who was your biggest influence to be who you are today? Who do you, can you, can you give that credit to? Well, I wish, I wish I could say I was a Southern girl. I spent some time in Birmingham, but I'm originally from the Washington, D.C. area. Um, but I would say that, you know, the influence are probably similar to people all over the country, all over the world. One of my greatest influences was my Girl Scout leader. I felt that this was, you know, somebody that she was a very can-do kind of person. And there was almost nothing that she was reluctant to take on or that she thought was beyond the capability of the girls in the troop. And I was really inspired by that. She was somebody who just never gave up, no matter whether you were trying to build your tent in the middle of a rainstorm or at a later point when we were traveling as a troop in Europe and we would miss a train in one city and we would be late at night and we'd have to figure out where to go. We found a way to recover from that and yeah. to move forward. Yeah. So definitely a, a key inspiration for me. Well, you know, that's, I, I, mean, I was just thinking about this today and I was like, you know, because when we grew up, you know, we have to admit we didn't have many female role models growing up. I don't remember really having those that we have today. I mean, we've got these celebrities and people now that we look up go, wow, you know, the steps that we've, that from where we're at years ago to now, but I was just thinking about who was my biggest influencer back when I was younger, and that was my dance teacher. Her name was Lindsay Hall, and she was just the most incredible individual. Like, when you walked in the room, you knew you were in her presence. Like, she was just, she was, she was beautiful an amazing individual, but I remember that. So it's amazing to know that those 
little, you know, those little things in life meant so much more to us and it carried with us, as, you know, even today, you know, so important to know that and those influences just change who we are um, and it takes that one person to believe in you um, and I think that that's great that you're in this business because you're getting people to believe in you and you're giving them just a little bit of who you are into your business so that they can believe in themselves, right? And because that's what it takes. It takes that one person to believe in us when it comes to our business. Do you ever feel like they had that aha moment when you're talking to a client? Do you feel that sometimes? You know, I think aha moments are sometimes uh, few and far between. Sometimes I feel that I'm just working through in a process with my clients, but I'm most gratified when I find that they trust me with the things that concern them most and to work through those issues, no matter how difficult or how sticky. And when they achieve success, however they define that for themselves, it might not be how I would define success for them, but it's how they define success and how they feel that they've reached the point of where they want to be and where they want to go. That's when I feel really happy for them because it's really about what they want and about what they're striving towards. And to the degree that I can support that and facilitate that journey for them, I'm incredibly honored by that. So I think the last question I'm going to ask you, because I think that it's so important to understand that business today is different than it was 10 years ago, right? And our connections are bigger. We are able to network with people more. There's a lot more opportunities. And it, I guess it all depends on how we, what we do with it. How do we connect with people? Um, do you really, you know, if you could go back and look at, do, have you learned a lot of important lessons through this process that you've been in? And do you constantly tweak, tweak it as you go um, and, re, you know, and change how you run your business now? Sure. I think there are always people that have given me valuable advice and whose guidance and wisdom I appreciate and whose resources have been great. Um, but there are also people that gave me advice that I took that I now look back and say, you know what, I should have trusted my gut and I should have gone with what worked for me. And it took me a little bit longer to find my path to what worked for me in business as opposed to what worked for someone else. Yeah. And those are, part of that comes with maturity, part of that comes with experience. But I think that's really critical is to be true to the kind of business, kind of values, the kind of service, and the kind of person that you want to be in your business and not to follow someone else's path just because it worked for them. You know, I think we're so quick to compare ourselves to other people. And um, I think that sometimes you have to really understand who you are as an individual. And when you understand that, it's not that you don't look at your competitors, not that you look at other people, and it is okay. But if you turn it off and really tune into who you are and why you're doing it, because you always got to have that why. Why are you in business? Why am I doing this? You know, it's, you know, and, and we can relate to the aspect of like the financial freedom. I don't have to work at eight to five. Well, you know what? When you run a business, let me tell you, it is a seven day a week job and it does not go away. Sometimes I get phone calls at seven o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I'll get some call, phone calls at seven or eight o'clock at night. Now, listen, my team sometimes will look at me like, Carl, I would never take that phone call at seven or eight o'clock at night. You know what? Yes, you would, right? If you were running your business and that client called you, especially a client that you know doesn't normally call you that late at night, sometimes you will pick up that phone call, you know, because you want to know that, you know, what we say no to sometimes can end up being a yes. Um, but as far as like business success, it's it's all about how we make it, right? And comparing ourselves to other people on what level they're at really doesn't need to be comparable. You need to understand who you are. And when you understand who you are, you're going to be okay, right, in your business. So losing clients, those fears, they're real. 
We, we can all say that. Um, and it's okay. We all make mistakes. We all do, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, if we were perfect, <laughs> we'd be million contrillionaires. But, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, talking to you today, really understanding the focus of why we need a business coach. Why do we need those those outside entities trusting in people like you can push us to a great degree and level us up in that business. Have you had those clients come back to you and say, thank you for helping me through this? Oh, the best compliment I get is when a client says, thank you, you really helped me. That's just incredibly rewarding. I think that matters no matter what business you're in. Yeah. If you really care about what you do, of course you care about the money and making enough money to sustain your business and support the people you need to support. But you also want to know that you've really made an impact and that people feel that your service has been well worth it for them. I have dogs here. So in the middle of our podcast, if you hear some dogs barking, as I have dogs in this in uh, in the, the area. So don't worry. But, um, well, I just want to tell you, thank you for coming on to our podcast. I hope we can do another one because you are an exceptionally, um, you know, wonderful person and sharing your information today was it's very helpful because I think it's important for us to share our, who we are in business and what we do. So thank you for coming on the podcast today. Well, thank you for having me. Those are very kind words. I'd love to come back and join you another time. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, you know, I mean, well, maybe one day you'll get to come over here this way and we'll have to have lunch. So I'd um, love that. That would yes. be great. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Laura. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. And we'll have another one pretty soon. Thank you. Successful business doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of hard work, dedication and persistence, which is what Coffee Hustle is all about. So there's no quick fixes here. It's just candid conversations featuring other successful business owners sharing tips and tricks.